He'll also give you a soft plate to receive, place to receive. Some people are so proud that you can't help them. You can't do anything for them. They're so proud. And that's the kind of person the Holy Spirit has to work on. Look at John chapter number 1 and verse 29 with me tonight. The Gospel of John chapter number 1 and verse number 29. You know, John the Baptist was not only a forerunner of Christ, John the Baptist was quite a preacher. <laughs> he was quite a preacher. He really was. I mean, he preached. And uh, so here in John 1, 29, the Bible said, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Bless this book now. Amen. You can be seated. Now, folks, I don't know that John ever sat at the feet of Gamaliel like the Apostle Paul did. I don't know that he ever had any, uh, any instruction professionally. His, his father was, uh, was uh, in the priesthood, and John was first cousin to Christ. And uh, we have a relationship here, but the bottom line is that he's not, uh, he's not necessarily what you would call. You probably categorize John with the Apostle Peter. Peter was a professional fisherman. And but when he wrote, he wrote under the inspiration of the scriptures. You've got to keep that in mind. And what we have here with John, when he sees the Lord Jesus coming, he said, the Lamb of God. All right, if he'd stop there, that's strong enough in itself. But look what he said. He said, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. That's a strong statement. Jameson Fawcett and Brown is a commentary that I would recommend to you. Now, I don't agree with their eschatology. But Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown is, is a good, especially for someone who's just been saved and wants to start out uh, studying the Bible. The word taketh away is iero, alpha, iota, rho, and omega. And that word means to take up and take away. It, uh, here's what they say, Jameson, Brown. The word signifies both as does the corresponding Hebrew word. Applied to sin, it means to be chargeable with the guilt. Let that sink in for a moment. And to bear it away. In the Levitical victims, both ideas met, as they do in Christ, the people's guilt being viewed as transferred to them, avenged in their death, and so borne away by them. Now that's loaded. That's something to think about when you get home. Because literally, John the Baptist was saying, that here's the one who's going to be charged with your guilt. Okay? And the Bible said he made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. In 2 Corinthians 5, to wit, God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. In other words, not making them chargeable for their sins, because Christ is chargeable for your sins, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God, for it hath made him to be sin for us. That's what we just read in John 1, 29. You see, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Now when we talk about repentance, and I mentioned it to you once before, it's un, it's, you need to understand what's going on with it, okay? There's a lot of controversy about this. There's a lot of people that say, well, if you don't repent of your sins, you can't be saved. Here's the problem. Is there one man arrogant enough in this world to tell me that he repented of every sin that he'd ever committed? Of course not. So what do you mean? Well, it brings you to frustration. Let's say you come to the altar and you begin to confess your sins. All right, and that's good. That's all right. Confess them. But can you remember every one of them? And you may become frustrated because you'll know in your soul, well, the Lord, I, I've repented as much as I can think of. Well, here's the thing. That's when you turn to Christ and say, Lord, there's no way I can remember all of this. I'm just going to have to receive your son. I'll receive him. I repent and receive him. And by doing that, you have received the Lamb of God that taketh away your sin. When it's the sin of the world, it's the sin of all mankind. And he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. Now what I'm dealing with tonight is theology. Because I'm going to show you how it's connected with what I'm following with. Theology is important. Because the theology of the New Testament is set in a completely different uh, uh, context as theology of the Old Testament. 
Uh, in the Old Testament, righteousness was an issue of what a man did and how he lived. In the New Testament, righteousness all points to a man. He has made into us righteousness. Notice what it says in John chapter number 16 and verses 7 through 12. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I'll send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sins. How many caught me? Sin singular. All right, now watch this. Watch this. He'll reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Now look at the definition, how he handles it. Of sin, because they believe not on me. You see that? Believing on Christ takes care of all your sins, even those that you could never remember. And I'm going to tell you right now, I have a terrible memory. Lord knows, man, I've, forget, I've repented of plenty of them. But I don't know that I can remember everything that I ever did before I got saved. Can you? But I know Christ. Now look at the context again. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father, and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. Now look what he says. This is, this is the kind of thing that ought to fire your mind up. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Isn't that remarkable? Now let's look at the context and let's break it down. First of all, he says of sin because they believe not on me. All right, now look what he says. And of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. And then of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. The issue of sin, number one, is settled in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The person. And if you sin after you've been saved, and you will, it should point you back to Christ. That's what the work of the Holy Spirit is. So this is the key here of sin because they believe not on me. Now I want to go to Matthew chapter number 12 and verse 31 with you tonight. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven to men. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. Well, you can't see the Holy Spirit. He's a spirit being, all right? But you can certainly tell when he's there. Now look at this. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whoso speaketh a word against the Son of Man, and many of them did. Did the Apostle Paul speak a word against Christ? <laughs> he raved. He raved against him. Okay, now look carefully. It shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. So what's that mean? That means the Holy Spirit is not going to deal with your fornication and your adultery, your lying and your stealing and your thievery. In other words, to get you to clean up from that, that's going to do you no good. The Holy Spirit is going to bring you to Christ He's the one that will take care of all of your sins. And that's what he's talking about here. When you refuse the Holy Spirit, who's the answer to all of your sins, Christ is. Christ is. And this is where self-righteousness comes in because there's an awful lot of people around. Believe me, they are. They have their list. They don't break their list. They don't violate their list. As far as they're concerned, they're in good shape. No, you're not. If you say you have no sin, you deceive yourself. If you say you have not sinned, you call God a liar. But this point is something that helps me understand what's coming up next. Okay. He quotes Psalm 51, verse 5. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Now, who said that? David. Yes, David. David the king. Now listen to this man. There has of late been some discussion as to the destination of those who die in their infancy before they're old enough to understand Jesus. Of course, the feel-good, tree-hugging, whale-loving liberals assert that God couldn't possibly send babies to hell, as this would be unfair or cruel, and that by some mysterious loophole in the rules, rules for salvation, God allows those who are too young to be accountable into heaven. No question asked. 
This man believes that there are right now month-old, two-month-old, three-month-old babies screaming beneath your feet in hell. This is why I dealt with theology first. Now look at it. As usual, the position of the liberals in this debate finds no support whatsoever in the scriptures. Scripture for that? No scripture. The Bible is clear. Everyone who has not accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, by the time they die, goes straight to the fiery bowels of hell. No exceptions, no excuses, including little babies. That's quite a remarkable thing, don't you think? What sends you to hell? Think on this for a moment, because an answer to this helps you understand the Bible. When he has come into the world, he'll convince the world of what? Sin. What sin? Because they believe not on me, the Lord Jesus Christ. Exactly. Because if you get into the quagmire of thinking that you've confessed all your sins, that that is somehow going to get you to heaven, you're dead wrong. Because no man's able to confess all of them. Because you can't remember all of them. But Christ is the one who taketh away the sin of the world. And this is why God said so. But now listen to this man. He said, our ancestor was Adam. He rebelled against God. That's enough. Since the fall, we are guilty for even existing. You don't know much about Christian theology if you don't know that. Scripture? No scripture. It's just a talking head. But he's on the internet. And there's a lot of people reading this stuff. All right. Now, wait a minute. What sends you to hell? Your sins or the sin? If you speak against the Son of Man while he was alive 2,000 years ago, you could be forgiven, right? But if you speak against the Holy Ghost who convicts you, your sins are an issue, but the conviction is about Christ who can take, take it away and cleanse you and forgive you. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. He never works in peripherals. He never halfway does a job. The Holy Ghost never brings you to a point and drops you. He will bring you to Christ. Amen. Because the answer. How many believe that? Yeah. All right. Let's get us. Anybody got a one month old baby around? <laughs> Let's ask that one month old baby. Do you believe in Christ? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Want something to eat? Uh, do you know you're a sinner? He can't answer any of that. He has no concept whatsoever. He can't even understand what you're saying to him. Right? So what's he guilty of? See, what's he guilty of? He is not guilty of rejecting Christ because he can't even conceive of Christ. He's not guilty of not confessing his sins because he doesn't have a clue what sin is. I remember reading a story a couple of days ago. It was awful good. It was real good. A man was talking to a blind woman, and he forgot that she had been blind from birth and had never seen anything. And she said, she said, is that a beautiful tree? He said, oh, that tree's beautiful. It's beautiful. It has yellow flowers on it. She said, what's that? She had nothing to compare yellow to. No way, no way, no way, no way. A little baby is not guilty of any sins. And it cannot be guilty of rejecting Christ. And that is where the Holy, Sp Holy Spirit enters in. And that's where he deals. So, here's what he says. As the theologian John Calvin demonstrated, there's nothing whatsoever that we can do by our own free will to get saved. Nothing. The only way to get saved is to get grace. And you can only get grace if God decides to give it to you. Now, we're talking about radical tu uh, uh, tulip. We're talking about extreme tulip. We're talking about total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and predestination. That's the foundation of hyper, hyper Calvinism. And this man is a hyper Calvinist. I'd like to say to him, my, isn't it so wonderful that you're one of the elect? And the little baby is going to burn in hell and scream while they're burning in hell forever. And you know, thought went across my mind, you know what? There's not really any difference between his God and Moloch. That's right. right. 
Now, you say, well, you know, he's, he's entitled to his belief. Yes, he is. Let me read something for you. This is a testimony that I took off the Internet a little while ago. And I'm going to just a part of it. This girl says she's an atheist now. An atheist. Raised in church, Sunday school, the whole nine yards. I made a profession of faith in Christ at one time. You know, she fully, fully knows the Bible and all that. But listen to this. One day I told her, her is her friend who's trying to win her to the Lord, even though the girl says, I am a Christian. But according to her friend, she's not a real Christian because she doesn't believe the way her friend believes. Now let's watch the way her friend believes. One day I told her how I hate when people preach about how every little thing is a sin that could send people to hell. I recounted a memory from Bible school where my teacher yelled that all of us eight-year-old students were going to burn in hell for playing around while she was trying to speak. Aren't you glad your soul's not in the hands of a man? Uh, now listen to this. This girl says to her friend, it's crazy that she said that, right? What a weirdo. Friend answers. Listen to the friend. My friend goes, no, she's absolutely right. People of any age can go to hell, even babies. Then there's an awkward silence. This girl's friend had just told her that babies can go to hell and shocked her, and so there's silence. It's like this. Babies know right from wrong. If you lay a baby down and tell it to sit still, but then it disobeys you and crawls away, the baby is sinning. Newborn babies can't crawl. Um, you know, I'm not a mama. How old? They got to be on up before they can start crawling. How old do they have to be? Six months? Somewhere. Well, then, you know, they're starting to grow. Okay. If you lay a baby down and tell it to sit still, but then it disobeys you and crawls away, the baby's sinning. If it somehow dies after that, it's going to go straight to hell and burn for eternity. Now, this girl apparently believed what she just told this woman. If you believe that, you're ready for the funny farm. By the way, no scripture. You know why? Because there is no scripture. Now, I got this off the internet. Five pretty good reasons to be an atheist. Number one, the Bible is ridiculous. Have you read the Bible? Have you read it? Have you read it and prayed over it? And the more you read it and the more you pray over it, the more light begins to come from it. How many have experienced that? And then after a while, you begin to say to yourself, you know, I misjudge this book. This book's a pretty powerful book. Uh -huh. Yeah, you do. You know why? As we believe, you believe, and I know you do, it's inspired. All right, so this, number one, it's ridiculous. They think they can read it like they can read a novel. Number two, we don't need no stinking deities. Ever since the Enlightenment, what he's referring to, uh, the Enlightenment, is referring back to the period of time when the philosophers and psychologists and, 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 and the rest of them, which would be about the 14, the 1500s, somewhere in there, began to come out against the Bible because they, they were thinkers. Uh, for example, Voltaire, French atheist. You ought to read how he died. Voltaire said, when well, speaking of Christ, curse the wretch. Well, he didn't curse the wretch on his deathbed. No, 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 no. He, by the way, Voltaire called the Pope not your holis, holiness, he called him your hellishness. <laughs> he was a French philosopher, atheist, well-known. You've heard his name, Voltaire. Okay, he said, curse the wretch. Now, where do you think he got that from? Uh, religions have been fighting a losing battle against science. No, it hadn't. How about the science of the, of the vaccines that have come out in the last three years? What about that science? Who won that one? They're just now admitting that it probably was a leak from the lab in Wuhan. And all of the 
big voices in the country said, oh, no way. It had to be a pangolin or it had to be two animals crossed or the fish market or this or that, this or that. No, now they're saying that it could have come out of the Wuhan. Now, if it did, and I believe it did, I did from day one, it has been gain of function. That's what they call it. Improved. In plainer words, it has been weaponized, all right? Begs the question. If this virus has been weaponized, and it has been, and millions of people have died from it, what's next? If they are weaponizing viruses, what's that tell you? That tells you that you could enter into a biological warfare that would make World War I look like a walk in a park when they used gas and they gassed each other in the trenches. Oh, yeah, biological warfare. Oh, yeah, that's something to think about. But anyway... Number three, the problem of evil. Is God willing to prevent evil but not able? You remember what it said in Romans chapter number 11? Of him, through him, and to him are all things. You remember what I quoted you and somebody helped me find it from Romans chapter number three? When thou art judged. We're here in this world to prove the right of righteousness of a man. We are in this world to prove that holiness will defeat evil. We're in this world to prove that the will of God and the mind of God is infinitely superior to any being he creates to come against him because he has an object lesson to teach his creatures. And that's what we're learning now. We're learning that object lesson. I'm telling you right now, folks, I had much rather by the grace of God live for the Lord tonight than anything I can think of. And I've watched, I mean, I have watched what's happened to people. There was a woman on television today who's lost two sons, folks, two teenage boys to fentanyl. She's lost two of her sons. And, of course, you can't imagine what that's done to her. And here, let me explain what that means. One of the boys thought he was taking a Percocet tablet, okay? One tablet, Percocet, and here's what happened to him. He stopped breathing he turned blue right before their very eyes, and he died by taking one pill. That's how lethal fentanyl is, okay? She lost two sons like that. Children are dying all over this country. Children we're talking about now, sons and daughters from fentanyl. Let me warn you tonight, I was a kid too. I marvel at these boys who sneak around and think we don't know what they're doing. Boy, I used to be a boy. <laughs> I grew up just like you did, and I know how impressionable young people can be, and I know what peer pressure is, and I understand all of that. And today it's a thousand times worse than it was when I was a kid because you live in a drug-saturated society. Don't ever, don't ever put that garbage in your mouth or shoot it into your veins because there, there has never lived. I want to parse my words carefully. There has never lived on this earth a greater fool than one who will shoot that into their veins or take that dope for the first time because you're walking down a slippery slope that will destroy your life and everybody around you. When you say drug, say death because that's all that comes of it. Number four, the problem with hell. Five good reasons to be an atheist. The problem with hell. The problem really not is with hell. The problem is the way it's preached and the theology backing it. Just like this garbage from Deacon Dixon about sending babies to hell. Do you know how many people out here that they just, they just shake when they hear you say that? If I hear another Baptist preacher get up and tell people that a baby, an infant, is going to burn in hell forever and scream forever, I believe I'll confront him to his face. I'm sick and tired of hearing that stinking garbage. You're destroying people with theology like that. That's pure garbage. That's all it is. And then number five, you just don't know. Well, you don't know. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't know. You don't know. I don't know what a day may bring forth. The Lord Jesus said that. But I do know this. I do know that when a person goes through circumstances and they don't know the Lord, they have no hope. But I know that if I go through some circumstance, I can pray. And I know God can change things. Prayer changes things. I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen too many times. 
Then I got on there and I looked. I lost my faith. I thought, why do people lose their faith? And here's man, I feel so sorry for him. He said, I lost my faith in God when I lost my daughter to cancer. I begged, I cried, I offered my life for hers, and day by day I watched that beautiful little angel slip off. So excuse me for, no, for not taking my seat next to you in Sunday. You on Sunday in church feel too cheated to worship. I, you know, I feel sorry for him. And what you ought to do with somebody is just pray the Holy Spirit comes to him. That's the main thing. Let the Holy Ghost come to him. Speak to his soul and help him. I told you about on board ship. I spent six months in the, in the uh, Mediterranean on a troop carrier. And uh, we hit the beach and did all that stuff. But anyway, I used to play a lot of poker. And as for I've saved, I'm not a poker player now. I uh, never was much count. And every time we got paid, I had to pay all these guys I owed money to <laughs> for poker. Every time I thought I had a good hand, somebody beat me, man. But this old boy, about six foot six, six foot seven, I'll never forget him. And uh, he's real smart, real smart. And uh, we were talking about God. We'd bring God up all the time. I said, yeah, man, I believe in a man upstairs. I believe in a supreme being. And that's what I said for years and years and years. He looked at me one time and he said, I don't. I said, how come? He said, I watched my little sister die. Watched her suffer and watched her die. If there's a God in heaven, why would he allow something like that? Well, of course, I was no apologist at the time for the Lord. I had no answer. You know, I had no answer. And no doubt, no doubt that he was bitter. He was bitter. And he'd lost somebody that was personal, dear, that he loved. And that was it. I mean, that's, and I pray that it, I pray. I've never seen him again. As a matter of fact, most of them I've never seen again. But I pray maybe somewhere along the line, the Holy Ghost came to him and uh, spoke to his heart and to his soul and gave him some comfort. This one says, I lost my faith in God when I was dead for around five minutes and there was no light or anything. You die, it's just blackness. For eternity and you get to go to rot in the ground, you're welcome. That's what he said. Not this guy, but another one. Um, first place, he wasn't dead. He wasn't dead. And he just simply went off into a coma. He went into a coma. And, but I don't know what he was looking for. But the bottom line is that the day may come, the day may come when he sees a whole lot more than he did this last time. Pray for him. Here's another one that says, I feel like I have lost my faith in God, humanity, and even my own self. I don't know where it has gone, and if I will ever get it back, I feel so lost right now. Isn't that sad? Yeah. There's a lot of people like that. They're out of church. They They've got a bunch of questions, but no answers. And then this one. What to do when you lose faith in God? Well, here's what I would counsel with anybody, if I could, to try to be a help to you. Be patient with him as he's been patient with you. Allow him to begin to take control of the circumstances of your life. Don't turn him off when he begins to speak to you. He loves you. The Lord has a reason, a purpose for you being here. He has a way of communicating with you that man cannot do. And just pray that somewhere along the line, this, this man right here gets his desire to live back again. You can be thrown for a loop, folks. And, uh, I mean, you can really be thrown for a loop. And if you're not careful, uh, it can destroy you in this life. I don't know what's coming tomorrow. I have no idea. But I do know this. I do know that the more the Lord teaches me of his word, and he has taught me something, uh, the more I appreciate the Bible and the more it angers me when I hear somebody who wants to get up and preach and he doesn't have a clue what he's talking about. That's sad. That really is. That's sad. You're not doing the grace. You're not doing the ministry of Christ any, any, any favors by, by doing that. Uh, and, and you hear it all the time. But uh, I pray, I pray as a pastor for what people go through here in the church I mean, man, I've, 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 I've been in situations that are, that are hard, folks, hard. I walked into the emergency room and took a girl by the hand, and I prayed with her in the emergency room. And while I was praying, all she could say was, God help me, God help me, God help me, God help me. Just as clear as I'm standing here tonight, God help me, God help me. And she was dead about four or five hours later. She's gone. She's gone. 
she's gone. I came back and her husband's sitting there holding her hand. And, her, and all, all he had was a body. She's gone. I've watched little children go into the emergency room over here at UT Hospital or somewhere over in there. Walk back in the back and here lies, here lies a mother with a perfectly formed little baby boy. Just beautiful little baby boy. Just as blue as he could be. He got wrapped up in the umbilical cord. Choked him to death. And carried him full term. Carried him, I mean, completely developed. Fact is, I, th I believe she was going through natural birth. But the baby got wrapped up. And there, lay, and there it lay. So we took that little body over here to this graveyard on across the road over there to Babyland. That was 40 years ago. We took it to Babyland and buried it. And I think about it a lot when I drive by there. I think about that little baby. And I think about how hard it was for her to get over it, and I don't think she ever got over it. I don't think she ever got over it. These are the things that people go through. I've watched them, I've watched them deteriorate under sicknesses, under cancer heart problems and so forth, and then watched them die. But I've also been there when they have died with great grace. Yes, they have. I'll never forget St. Mary's Hospital. I went in to see this dear soul, said, Preacher, come over here. And I bent over, she said, I got something I want to tell you. She said, I saw it. I look way out there, and she said, there's a beautiful city out there, just as beautiful as it can be. I saw that city. She said, I'm going there, and I'll be gone probably before you ever come back to see me again. And she was gone that day or the next day on to that city lying over there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I've had a number of them tell me right there on their deathbed what they've seen and what they've heard. And the grace of God is going to be with us. He'll be with us wherever we go, whatever we have to go through. And uh, I'm, I'm certain of that. I'll close with this one thing tonight. I know by experience, I've been through a few things myself, and uh, there's been two or three times, two or three times, when all this heart problem started with me, and uh, I was in heart failure there for a while, and I know what heart failure feels like. You can't get your breath, you can't breathe, and your shorter, shortness of breath, and uh, I was like that. And I got to the point one time where I thought I was dying, and I just simply said, Lord, here I am. Here I am. I'm ready to go, ready to go, ready to go. I hope you're. I hope you. I hope you can do that tonight. I hope you're ready. I hope you're ready. I hope you're ready to go. This faith that we have, there's no fear in death. You know that uh, Irish girl, uh, Getty, Getty, the Gettys. Uh, they're from Ireland, and uh, uh, no fear in death is uh, is. Uh, I forget the name of the tune. And uh, you ought to look it up. Chris, Kristen, Kirsten Getty. Look her up on YouTube. She's got some beautiful songs. And uh, one of them is No Fear in Death. Thank God for that. Because the Old Testament saints, the Bible said, all their lifetime were in fear of death. And for one thing, they didn't go the same place we do when you pass on. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Amen. That's going to come. And when it comes, it comes. So what if it doesn't? Well, it may not because the Lord may come. And I'm looking for that. When I walk out of this house tonight, I'll say, even so come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen, amen. So I'll close with this tonight. What did God really save you from when he saved your soul? Do you know what he really saved you from? He saved you from unbelief. This is the condemnation, John said, that light has come into the world. That's Christ. He's light. But men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Therefore, to reject the light is damnation. Father, bless your word. Thank you for the time we have together. I pray as I help somebody, I pray for them. I pray, Lord, for these people I mentioned here. I know it's been a terrible, terrible thing that they've had to live through, but I pray you'd bless them somehow or another. Bring somebody into the life that they know cares, somebody that really cares. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right.